so the city of Chesapeake is under contract with TFC for uh, recycling until the end of June. Uh, after uh, June, once we get into July, uh, the city will be established in seven drop-off centers and they'll be geographically dispersed around the city. Uh, so your cardboard, your plastics, uh, your tin cans, you'll be able to take and drop those off. The other thing that we're doing is we're working with private vendors uh, to set up uh, subscription-based recycling services. And these are best described as Uber-type services. So, you know, you'll, you'll uh, 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 co contract with the vendor, uh, you, you'll uh, agree on collection time frames, collection days. They will come to you. They will pick up at your door. That's really how they're structured. So, uh, you know, they won't be servicing the blue bins. They, they won't be coming with a big truck. They'll be coming in smaller vehicles, uh, collecting the recyclables that way. So, so far we've identified two uh, private vendors that can provide recycling uh, service on a subscription basis. Uh, those are Recyclops and Happy Planet Recycling. Uh, you can find links to both of them on the City of Chesapeake uh, webpage dedicated to recycling. So citizens will be able to keep their blue bin and starting in July, uh, they can use that as an additional trash can. The City of Chesapeake will service the blue bins just like they would the brown bins. But, but, but a lot of questions about uh, what's the status of the blue bin collection? So, you know, we're continuing to work with our vendor to have those cans serviced. Uh, you know, they're, we're under contract with TFC until the end of the month. We expect them to provide the service that, that they've been contracted with. Uh, if, however, that hasn't happened come July, the city of Chesapeake will be there to pick up those blue bins. Yeah, so I know a lot of our citizens are, are you know, have the feeling of they'll believe it when they see it, and I certainly understand the sentiment. I can tell you we're getting really close. So, you know, I think everybody knows this is an Army Corps of Engineer uh, administered project, and they are down to the final property that they need to move forward with the project. Uh, so the, the funding uh, has been allocated, the, the plans are done, the utility relocations are well underway. So I uh, spoke with the Army Corps of Engineers recently. Their plan is to advertise for construction within the next 30 days. Uh, once they do that, they'll go through uh, you know, the, the bid solicitation, they'll review the bids. Sometime later this fall, they'll have a construction contract in place and we'll actually start construction later this fall. Your toilet's not a trash can or a place where you toss cotton swabs, paper towels, tissues, or floss. And what about so-called flushable wipes? The answer is no. They get stuck in your pipes. And now that you have a big problem with plumbing, that problem keeps coming and coming and coming. Clogs lead to backups that make a big mess in your home and your neighborhood. That is, unless... You don't toss in tampons, cat litter, or trash. Not even a goldfish gets flushed with a splash. Toilet paper is one thing that can go in the loo, as well as the obvious, number one and number two. Just your personal business. That's it, no more. This message is critical, please don't ignore. Just your teepee and your pee and your poo should go down the bowl, all else is taboo. Go to askhrgreen.org in a rush that's where you'll find what not to flush. Hurricane Isabel was one of our larger storms we had um, in the history of Dominion and uh, it was a little bit over a two week restoration and that was kind of a catalyst for us to learn a lot of about our restoration process and make some major changes in how we respond prior to that event and then during that event. So the biggest issue is obviously going to be the wind uh, and what the, the damage that the wind causes. Uh, broken limbs, broken trees, flying debris. Uh, that debris in those limbs will you know, tear down our wire. It'll break the top of poles out. It'll break uh, cross arms. Um, and that's most of what we're having to deal with is replacing cross arms and pulling up wire. We just changed some of our processes and how we switched um, to get the lights on when we changed to alternate feeds. Uh, there was in, in how we stage crews and just and how we just the preparation before the storm and getting crews in place and the, what we anticipate to be the highly in, uh, impacted areas. We have our own tree people. Um, if the storm is large enough or there's enough damage or we need more help, we've got contractors that we call in to aid. Once the storm hits and it's safe for us to go out, uh, we're working in rotating 16-hour shifts. We have people on the clock 24 hours a day uh, and it'll be that way until all the lights are restored. If you come across the line uh, that's down in your yard, uh, stay away from it. Uh, we've got people that are, you know, working around the clock that are available to come out and make the scene safe and identify what the wire is.
Hampton Roads Transit has 2,700 bus stops across the region spread over six of our host cities. So that's roughly 350 stops with either a shelter, bench, and or trash can. There's a perception issue out there. A lot of times we'll get calls and complaints from people uh, when they'll literally be calling hours after the stop has been cleaned to report that there's trash. And it's literally because it's a constant involving cycle of issues. Of course, number one being trash, uh, broken glass, graffiti, bent signs, broken signs, or missing signs. They're always something. Our shelters and our bus stops are the first things that our customers see when they enter our system. And we want that to be a positive experience. The Am I Clean campaign is an effort to clean up the HRT amenities for everyone to have a nice ride. They're going to be installing QR codes on shelters, on trash bins, on, you know, any kind of facilities they have. And passengers will be able to use their phone, scan that code, and then immediately report an issue. Uh, it's a simple, easy, and anonymous way for people to report issues using their smartphone. The trash bin is overflowing, they can report that. You know, if a panel is broken, they can report that. And that will uh, send a form directly to HRT. Then HRT would let us know that there was a situation that needs to be taken care of. And then that's when I would call our crews out to go take care of it. We want our property to represent us in the highest capacity. We want our property to look good, clean, fresh, sanitized, just to be aesthetically pleasing to our patrons. This is one of our big three initiatives for our Earth Day month. Who wants to sit around a bunch of trash and whatnot? And the customers should definitely be held responsible for keeping this clean as well, especially since we got to come here and use it. And it also allows for positive feedback. So if the stop is clean and in good condition, that option will be there as well. You don't have eyes everywhere, but it's like we're all working together so we can all help each other out, which lets us feel like we did our part in the community. The public and our customers are feeling engaged and empowered to help us out in maintaining these stops. We're looking to nearly triple the number of passenger amenity stops in our systems. That's a huge amount of new responsibility for our contractors and our internal service crews and just a lot more assets to keep track of uh, on a daily basis. So magnet fishing is nothing but having a big magnet and a rope and tossing it into a body of water and seeing what you pull up. And you'd be amazed at what you can find. There's so much trash and treasure, uh, bikes, shopping carts, guns, artifacts, you name it, you can find it. There's some father-daughter teams out there. There's couples like us, grandparents and getting the grandkids out. Relatively inexpensive. It's almost like uh, metal detecting. I got involved um, during the pandemic. I know a lot of people were watching YouTube and TikTok and I started seeing magnet fishing on social media. And I saw it and I was interested and I said, you know what, I'd like to try that. And then I guess I've always been looking for something to create videos and uh, content create. And so I put two and two together and started a magnet fishing YouTube channel. Uh, I was honestly shocked that I got into it as much as I did. I, the first time he ever did, I was kind of like, well, that's a little of a weird hobby, and watched some of his videos, and I was like, oh, okay. And then he took me out one day, and the first time I was just, like, hooked. Um, I feel it's like the thrill of the finds. Like, you throw out and you feel, you can feel the magnet, like, attract something. You can feel it kind of click on, almost like you can with fishing. And it's kind of like, oh, snap, what do I have? So you're kind of, like, pulling it up and seeing if it's really heavy, then you're like, oh, I've definitely got something big. That's awesome. Really, it's, I enjoy it. It's a hobby. It's something to do. You're cleaning the environment. I enjoy taking all the metal that I find and taking it to the scrapyard and getting a little extra money. And just some of the, the cool things I've found and people I've met along the way have really, really been cool. People can learn things from watching you magnet fish, and I, I learn a ton of things from watching other magnet fishers. And there's kind of a, there's a community on YouTube, and there's actually a group of us that we keep in touch, and there's a camaraderie to it. I like what Jacob was saying, the camaraderie about the YouTube channel is I've 
kind of branched out. I mean, I'm not going to start my own channel by any means, but I've kind of branched out, kind of engaging with the other creators. Um, we have done some meetups. We went to Florida and met up with some um, other YouTubers there. We went to New York and visited some family and met up with YouTubers there. We're just kind of making friends along the way, so that's really cool. So this will show you just how strong this magnet is and how big the field is. See, it's pulling the carabiner from inches and inches away. These, these magnets are super strong. Anything uh, ferrous is gonna, gonna attract right to it. And you gotta be careful with these big magnets. Uh, if you get your hand between this and something magnetic, it can, it can definitely break your hand and smash your fingers. Always recommend you wear gloves. You never know, fishing hooks, sharp pieces of metal, knives. Wanna make sure you don't uh, Cut yourself with something rusty. Make sure your tetanus shot's up to date. <laughs> so with this one, it's 360 degrees of pull. So it actually, the top, bottom, side. So if you get this thing in the water, anywhere near something magnetic, it, it picks it up. Ooh. It's, it's good for the water because you're getting the rusty metal out. Um, you're taking it's great for fishermen, actually. Fishermen usually love us, as long as you're not throwing your magnet directly next to somebody that's trying to fish. <laughs> Fishers love us because we clean the obstacles and stuff out of the water. I mean, I can't tell you how many shopping carts, bikes, things that I've found with fishing lures and fishing line all over them. And that's another great thing. You're getting all that fishing line out of the water, trash. It's just a lot of people throw things in the water that shouldn't be there. And it's, it's hazards for boats, people swimming, people fishing. I like the motto that a lot of magnet fishers kind of took on is leave every place better than how you found it. So we show up, if there's trash laying around or other magnet fishers have been there, they leave their things. We always make sure to clean up after them too.